All right, Dr. Acosta, thank you so much for joining us. So we've all heard about bariatric surgery, but we might not know the details of what exactly goes into it, how does it work? Explain it for us. Yes, bariatric surgery is a surgical procedure that's meant to help people who suffer with uh, obesity and obesity-related uh, problems. Um, bariatric surgery is a procedure that's done on a, a minimally invasive platform. Uh, this means that it's done through, uh, through small uh, little incisions in the patient's uh, abdomen uh, where the procedure is done via a TV monitor or a TV screen. Uh, here recently, besides the traditional laparoscopic procedure, uh, these are also done via the uh, uh, robotic platform uh, that gives the, the surgeon uh, more uh, detail, it gives us a 3D image of the procedure, um, as well as more control with the instruments that are done, uh, used with the robot, uh, translating to faster recovery times and uh, decreased pain scores uh, after surgery. Um, the type of procedures that are, are done for uh, weight loss to help patients with their comorbid conditions and their weight problem. Uh, the two most common procedures done here in the United States uh, are one uh, referred to as the vertical sleeve gastrectomy. And the vertical sleeve, this is a surgical procedure where uh, we uh, make a much a smaller stomach. Uh, we transect, divide the stomach. Uh, the patient ends up with a, a stomach that's markedly reduced in size, probably about 80 75 to 80 cc capacity, so, so mark reduction in capacity compared to the original size of the stomach, which is about a liter and a half. So we can see how much we decrease capacity on those patients. Uh, but in addition to making a smaller stomach, decreasing the capacity, what this is gonna translate into is that now patients eat a small uh, portion uh, of food and they get satisfied, they get, they get full, and, and they, they, the end effect is they, they stop eating. In addition to decreasing capacity, this procedure, what it also does, it changes the intestinal hormones. So the hormones in the, uh, there are hormones that are secreted by the stomach that induce hunger. Uh, by doing this procedure, removing that portion, that extra portion of stomach, this is gonna reduce some of those hunger hormones. The end effect is not only restriction, but also that the patients have and report less hunger. So uh, after surgery, they tend to eat because it's time to eat and not because they have a sensation of hunger. So that, that tends to go away on a big majority of patients uh, with this kind of procedure. Um, there's a secondary procedure as well called the uh, Ruin Y gastric bypass. Uh, that's also meant for weight loss. Uh, this is also done minimally invasive through small incisions uh, through the laparoscopic or robotic platforms. Uh, different than the vertical sleeve, this particular procedure, uh, we divide the stomach and make the stomach also a very small size, probably about the size of a boiled egg. So that's the capacity of the new stomach. Uh, with gastric bypass, in, addi in addition to doing this, we also connect the small intestine to the stomach uh, and we bypass all of the majority of the stomach and about 150 centimeters of small intestine. So this particular procedure is not only restrictive, but it also gives the per, uh, patients a degree of malabsorption. So whatever calories they do consume, um, a lot of those calories actually don't get absorbed. So it gives them uh, uh, restriction along with malabsorption and those two components uh, help patients uh, tremendously for their uh, weight loss journey. Does one procedure have uh, better, I'm sorry, let me ask that question again, three, two, one. Does one procedure see better results than the other? Is one more dangerous than the other? Does it depend on the person? Yes, so very, very good questions. Um, so both procedures are, are very successful in weight loss. That's why these procedures are the two most common ones in the United States. Uh, with either procedure, we tend to see uh, approximately about 60% uh, excess body weight loss. And this happens fairly quickly, generally within a year after surgery, most patients are able to reach that goal of about 60% excess body weight loss. Uh, with gastric bypass, because it does have that malabsorption component, uh, we do see a little bit more weight loss, maybe five, 10% more compared to a sleeve. Uh, but both of them are very successful uh, in regards to weight loss. 
Uh, a lot of the, uh, the questions that, that I get from patients is like, okay, you know, they both sound like they work very well. Uh, which one might be better for me or which one might be a good choice for me? Um, so both surgeries are great. I think both surgeries have a very good success. Uh, it's not like one surgery is good or one's bad, one's evil and one's not evil. They're both excellent surgeries. Um, the biggest difference on how we help patients choose or which way to go uh, has to do with that individual uh, patient's medical history. We know there are certain medical problems uh, where we see one procedure do better than the other for specific uh, type of issues. Okay, a good example of that or example of those kind of problems, um, one of them would be uh, diabetes. Uh, so what we find on patients who are diabetic, uh, once they're already on a higher uh, medical regimen, shooting insulin, maybe not being able to control their diabetes too well, we see that gastric bypass tends to be superior uh, in making diabetes go away. And uh, you know, a lot of people think, well, what, what happens? Is it the weight loss that does it or what's going on? Well, it's not just the weight loss that does it, it's actually what we do during surgery, the dividing of the stomach, the rerouting of intestine, that changes intestinal hormones as well favorably to help diabetes uh, resolve or go away. And this is pretty, uh, pretty significant. Uh, we see uh, my record holder was a gentleman that on a daily basis, he was shooting 300 plus units of insulin every single day, a lot of insulin. Um, he had surgery, six months out from surgery, he went down to zero. So no longer shooting insulin. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an impact that, that uh, stays with patients. Okay, so uh, this particular patient, I've seen him 10 years in a row on yearly visits, and he's still completely off insulin. So for certain particular pro uh, pro uh, problems like diabetes, bypass is better. Another one where bypass is superior is for people with chronic acid reflux. So those with really bad heartburn uh, or reflux disease, uh, bypass tends to be superior for those patients. 95% of the patients with acid reflux after a bypass, 95% of them reflux goes away overnight, uh, almost immediately. So, so this is where we have to assess, we have to talk to patients and assess what their me medical conditions might be. And you know, sometimes one becomes more favorable than the other, um, specifically for that person's medical history. We got to take a quick break. We are talking about bariatric surgery here on nine on nine this evening. When we come back, we're going to talk about who should consider the surgery. What makes a good candidate? Thanks for being with us. And yeah, welcome back to nine on nine. We are talking about bariatric surgery this evening and we are joined by Dr. I'm sorry. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Jorge Acosta. Let me do that again all over again. I was getting tripped up by the title. I didn't want to mess it up. Sorry. Three, <laughs> three, two, one. Now, welcome back to 9 on 9. We are talking about bariatric surgery this evening, and we are joined by Dr. Jorge Acosta, the medical director of the Las Palmas Bariat. Oh, I knew it. Let me do it again. In three, <laughs> two, one. Now, welcome back to 9 on 9. We are talking about bariatric surgery this evening, and we are joined by Dr. Jorge Acosta, the medical director of the Las Palmas del Sol Bariatric Center. Sir, thanks again for being with us. Who makes a good candidate for this kind of surgery? So uh, these are patients uh, who have already tried conservative approaches uh, at weight loss, whether it be diets or exer uh, exercise regimens or uh, psychotherapy, et cetera, et cetera, and, and they're not successful to, uh, in being able to keep the weight off. Uh, once uh, a person reaches a certain degree of obesity and they're not successful with conservative approaches, this is somebody that we uh, start uh, thinking about, uh, giving them the option of uh, bariatric surgery. In general terms, um, the patients that can be considered uh, candidates for surgery uh, breaks down to uh, a medical terminology referred to as body mass index or BMI. Uh, for patients that have a body mass index or BMI higher than 35, between 35 and 40, um, and this person has a comorbid condition, so something like type 2 diabetes, hypertension, or sleep apnea with that kind of body mass index, uh, most insurance carriers are going to consider uh, this uh, patient uh, as a potential candidate for surgery. 
BMI, body mass index between 35 and 40, that's approximately about 80 pounds uh, in excess of ideal body weight, uh, roughly, ballpark. Um, but that's, that's kind of the guidelines we follow. Uh, above that, that, that uh, BMI uh, stage the, is the BMI of 40, 40 or higher. Uh, somebody with a body mass index of 40 or higher uh, is um, referred to as morbid obese. And uh, somebody with that type of BMI without necessarily having any other comorbid conditions because of the high BMI, they can also be considered as a uh, candidate for surgery uh, as well. These are the guidelines that most insurance carriers are going to follow, and this is what we follow as a center as well. Um, there's another category, which is actually a lower weight, uh, and this is a body mass index of 30 to 35. Um, for that lower weight category, our governing um, uh, body, which is the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, uh, they also consider these patients as potential candidates because uh, what we see is these patients are already obese. Um, unfortunately, for a big percentage of them, over time, they will progress to severely obese and eventually to morbid obesity. So our governing entity sees benefit of intervening sooner for those patients who are already obese. But for general terms for insurance coverage, these are BMIs of 35 and above that can be considered for surgical uh, coverage with insurance carriers. If somebody decides that they want to have the surgery and it looks like they are a good candidate, is there something that they can do to prepare? Do you put them on a special diet before? Uh, take us through that process. Yes, so we have uh, at the Las Palmas uh, del Sol Bariatric Center, uh, we have a, a comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary program uh, to help uh, patients along the way. The very, very first stage, the very first step uh, for patients uh, is to uh, very easily, they can do this at the comfort of their home, um, they can uh, proceed with an online seminar. And this is 24-7, they log in on our website, uh, loseweightalpaso.com, and uh, on that website they'll be able to tap on a they'll be able to click on a tab that uh, has uh, weight loss seminars. They click on it at the comfort of their home. Whenever they want to, they take what's referred to as an informational seminar. The seminar gives the patients very, very good basic information of what the surgeries are, how they work differently, pluses, uh, minuses, benefits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's the starting point to, to get some education. Um, from that point forward, if a person uh, wishes to, to proceed further, uh, then they're scheduled for a first appointment. And on that first appointment, they, of course, get to, get to meet the whole uh, bariatric team, which consists of, uh, of our bariatric nurses. We have uh, registered dietitians that are part of the program 100%, so we don't share with the hospitals. They're dedicated to our program because this is very specific to, to this kind of procedure. Um, of course, they'll be able to see me as a surgeon, so they get the whole, the whole uh, evaluation by the whole team. Uh, in addition to that, uh, part of what we have for our center, uh, we have insurance liaisons. So this is uh, uh, different than other surgeries and that this does require a uh, more involved approach with the insurance carriers to get the patients approved through, through the process. So uh, we, uh, we were blessed to have very good members in our, in our, um, our medical uh, uh, bariatric center uh, to help patients every step of the way. Um, besides the preparing for surgery, preparing them for dietary modifications, what kind of diet is going to follow after surgery, um, in addition to that is the long-term follow-up. So again, different than other procedures, this kind of surgery does require follow-up after surgery. We're going to need to be monitoring a patient's weight loss, that they're meeting their targets, that nutritionally they're doing well, so we have to start checking uh, blood work and laboratory values to make sure that that there's no nutritional or uh, concerns with those, with those patients. They're followed for life. Uh, we, obviously, the first year is more intense, and then after stability, then we start seeing those patients uh, yearly. So this is something that does require uh, lifelong follow-up, and we're we're happy with our very happy with our center and the, the components of the center to help patients every every step of the way. And I know that you perform robotic bariatric surgery. I want to talk about that, but first we got to take another quick break. You're watching Nine on Nine here on KTSM Nine News. 
Welcome back to 909. We are talking about bariatric surgery this evening, and we are joined by Dr. Jorge Acosta from the Las Palmas del Sol Bariatric Center. Uh, doctor, you perform robotic surgery also when it comes to bariatric surgery. Uh, how does that work? Talk to us about that. So uh, robotic surgery is, uh, for lack of better analogy, this is kind of like the sequential evolution of, of surgery. Uh, we started in the very beginning with open surgery or traditional surgery where a large incision was made across the abdomen to perform a procedure. From there, this uh, evolved uh, into a much better approach, which was the laparoscopic approach where a camera was inserted inside the abdomen and through small incisions, we would do a, an operation via a TV monitor or a flat screen. Uh, robotic surgery kind of takes that one step ahead in the, uh, in the uh, evolution of, of surgical technology and that now uh, the surgeon is sitting in a, in a console uh, in the same room where the patient's having surgery, uh, controlling the instruments through a, uh, a robotic uh, console. The, the advantages of that, there's many advantages, uh, not just on the surgeon's side, but also on the patient's side. Um, one of the big advantages is that with robotic surgery, uh, the surgeon is able to uh, see the image in, in 3D. So we, we have a 3D view, which we've never had before. We have depth of perception with a 3D image, which uh, we never had before. Uh, so as far as the optics, uh, what our surgeon sees is, uh, is uh, completely amazing. Um, in addition to uh, improved optics, is also improved um, instrument articulation or movement. Uh, what the robotic platform gives the surgeon is our instruments that instead of working on a, on a single hinge, uh, the robotic instruments actually work like human wrists, actually double wrists. So they bend uh, back and forth, so it gives the surgeon uh, much better control and much better mobility of those instruments. Um, the patient advantages uh, that are associated with, with robotic surgery, the, what I've seen in my experience, uh, doing bariatric surgery with the robot uh, is that because a lot of the deflection is actually the instrument tips with the wrist of the instruments, there's very little deflection at the point of entry in the patient. So this tends to translate to less postoperative pain. Uh, what I've seen personally since adopting the robotic platform, uh, before patients would have to stay in the hospital two nights, uh, after a robotic procedure, 85% of the patients are now spending one night in the hospital because they feel so good and their really narcotic usage has done, gone down significantly. Um, so so there, there are those advantages uh, that are associated with the, robot that, that are, with the robot that are favorable for both the surgeon and, and the patient as well. You probably hear this a lot, and I could hear some of my relatives maybe saying this, but they're like, oh, I don't know about robotics. What, what do you say to patients like that to kind of ease their concerns? Well, um, again, it's, a, it's an evolution of, of, uh, of medical technology. Uh, is a laparoscopic procedure good or bad, or is a robotic procedure good or bad? Absolutely not. I think they're both excellent procedures. Uh, on the right hands, uh, I think they're, they're very useful. These are just adjuncts that we have as surgeons to see better and to do things better. Uh, again, it's not like one's good and one's bad. I think they're both great procedures. They're both great platforms. It's just, again, an evolution of uh, what we're able to do and what we're able to see. From a surgeon standpoint, I think if you give me the option, hey, you have this where you can see a lot better and your instruments, your, you have way better control of the instruments and what the instruments can do, uh, I think it's going to be very tough for a patient to say, no, let's not do that one. Uh, let's do something where you have, um, uh, you know, you have less control and the optics are not as good. We've got to take one more quick break. We're going to come back with some final thoughts. This is 9 on 9. We're talking bariatric surgery tonight. Thanks for being with us. We are talking bariatric surgery tonight on 9 on 9. And we just got a few minutes left. But before we go, Dr. Jorge Acosta, the Las Palmas del Sol Bariatric Center. Uh, tell us just a little bit more about it. Well, uh, one of the important aspects of the bariatric center is that this is uh, specifically meant for bariatric patients. Uh, this is a journey. It's a journey from the time we meet the patient, from uh, getting them prepared for surgery, from education as a big component of it. 
Um, we have uh, staff uh, that's available 24 seven. So somebody has surgery after surgery, they have a question wasn't answered, or they're having a problem with uh, one of their nutritional shakes or any issues, there's somebody 24 seven that can talk to those patients to kind of help them through the process. So this is unique uh, in that we, we guide the patients, we, we nurture to them, we take care of them, we follow them. Uh, there are, you know, there are our, uh, our goal to get them through the process and make this as successful as we can make it for each individual patient. Hi, Dr. Acosta, thank you so much for joining us, sir. My pleasure, it's a pleasure to be here, thank you. And thank you for being with us at home. Don't forget that if you missed any part of our show tonight, you can always watch it on KTSM.com. I'm Daniel Marin, this is 9 on 9. Have a great evening, everyone. See you later.